Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country's army will carry out a military operation against the Gaza city of Rafah, even if a ceasefire agreement is reached. Haiti's Transitional Presidential Council on Tuesday elected its president and appointed a new prime minister to restore political order in that nation. And in Colombia, authorities detected that over one million ammunition, explosives, grenades and weapons are missing after carrying out inspections within the security forces on February 12th in Tolemaida and on April 1st in La Guajira. Hello and welcome to From the South. I'm Alejandra Garcia from Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said his country's army will carry out a military operation against the Gaza city of Rafah, even if a ceasefire agreement is reached. In an official statement issued on Tuesday, Netanyahu reiterated that the idea of stopping the war against Gaza before Israel achieves its objectives is out of the question. The Israeli Prime Minister's statements come amid reports of a new ceasefire proposal being discussed between Hamas and the Zionist government, which includes a discussion to restore a sustainable peace in Gaza after an initial release of hostages on humanitarian grounds. We will enter Rafah because we have no other choice. We will destroy the Hamas army. We will complete all the objectives of the war, including the repatriation of all our hostages. The member of the political bureau of the Islamic Jihad movement, Ithas Ataya, denounced on Tuesday the U.S. attempts to change the aid crossing to Gaza and put an end to the Palestinian resistance. The leader also warned that the delay of the Israeli aggression against Rafah is not due to humanitarian reasons, but to Washington's interest with the floating pier it is trying to build. Isan Ataya emphasized that the objective of the pier is to modify the access routes in the Gaza Strip at passes besieged by U.S. and Israeli forces. The Islamic leader also pointed out that his government and Hamas reject any attempt to divide the Palestinian resistance. For the second week in a row, university students in the United States continue their protest in solidarity with Palestine and against the aggression of the Israeli occupation forces. Students from several universities in the country have joined those of the University of Columbia in their support of the Palestinian cause. Local media have said that state police have arrested thousands of students and have denounced repression and censorship by the government. Despite calls to stop the protest, the students say they will not leave the street and will continue to reject the Israeli genocide in, in Palestine. The students denounce the U.S. government's complicity with the aggression that has left over 118,000 people affected among murdered, wounded and missing. University students in France have also raised their voices for the Palestinian people after the military support to Israel by the West and the United States. The French authorities reported different mobilizations in at least four institutes of political studies where the students blocked the access to the facilities to denounce the genocidal actions of Israel against Palestine. Demonstrators also are demanding that the educational institutions code their ties with Israel. Lebanon also joined the international university protest in favor of the Ghazali citizens and against the Israeli occupation. Lebanese university students rallied on Tuesday at the campus of the American University of Beirut. The demonstrators urged the university authorities to impose sanctions against companies linked to the Israeli regime and the, to condemn the attacks against Lebanon and Palestine. Lebanese students joined the mobilizations in the United States and Europe, which have been going on for two weeks and denounced the crimes committed by Israel. In Venezuela, the Federation of University Students, FVEO, rallied on Monday against the Israeli genocide in Palestine. The organization did not limit itself to condemning Israel, but also criticized the U.S. complicity with 
which in addition to supporting Israel, threatens university students who join the cause. The president of the organization, Dave Olivares, declared that this has led to massive mobilizations and protests around the world, as more than 60 universities have raised their voices in rejection of the war and in defense of the Palestinian people. The university students also encouraged young people to protest worldwide against the brutal attack on the Palestinian people that has claimed the lives of thousands of innocent victims. Let's take a short break. Remember, you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and more. All the stories coming up, stay with us. Welcome back. Haiti's Transitional Presidential Council on Tuesday elected its president and appointed a new prime minister to restore political order in that nation. According to a communique from the Presidential Transition Council, the vote took place in the presence of the press and representatives of the sectors that agreed on the creation of this council. The political council appointed Edgar Leblanc as president of the institution in charge of the country's transition and named former sports minister Fritz Belizer as the country's new prime minister. Minister. Haiti's Transitional Council leaders will have until February 7, 2026 to reach a national consensus and hold elections. Let's review the profile of the president of the Transitional Council in Haiti. Edgar Leblanc is an engineer and a member of the collective of the January 30th political parties. He has been politically active since 1986 and participated in regional initiatives as a member of parliament and was an electoral candidate in 2016 to fill the presidential vacuum left after the end of Martelli's mandate. With studies in economics and transport management, he worked in the transport department of the Ministry of Public works. We stay in Cuba at the moment as the Second Congress on the need for a new international economic order continues in Havana, a space to address issues related to the problems that hinder development and world peace. Distinguished economists, academics, experts and politicians from around the world meet to discuss issues arising from the an unbalanced economic, political, scientific, technological and military international order. The event allows for the promotion of strategies for the Global South to make sovereign decisions. The meeting coincides with the 50th anniversary of the establishment of a new international economic order approved by the United Nations General Assembly on May 1, 1974. During the Second Congress on the New International Economic Order held in Havana, our correspondent Irma Shelton interviewed Atiyah Juarez, independent expert of the Human Rights Council, who gave her opinion on how the Congress is held in a country blocked for more than 60 years. I really wanted to see the resilience of people that have been engaged in a, a way or a method of having an economy where it hasn't received support from many parts of the world and to try and understand from an economic perspective, because I'm the special rapporteur, independent expert on foreign debt, that this is a country that only receives uh, private debt, but not public debt. So being able to understand how an independent country is able to engage in this, and then that still seeks new ways of thinking and new ways of dealing with issues is, is a testament to the resilience of the people, but is also something to be said for the right to be different and then the right to think differently, the right to have a different way or uh, approach to life. And I think it is something that should be celebrated. During the Second Congress on the New International Economic Order held in Havana, our correspondent Irma Shelto also spoke with Senegalese economist Ndongo Samba Sijar. The expert referred to the importance of drafting a joint agenda to achieve a sustainable economic order. I think we had very important presentations that uh, made a diagnosis of the current world where we are living in. Uh, learnings also from the new international economic order in the 1970s because that agenda failed to some extent because we saw that once it was launched the response immediate response from the global north 
had been the imposition of structural, man, structural adjustment plans. And now we have to think about all of that to learn from the past so as to be able to create you know, an opening for the kind of for fair global system we are aspiring to. Now the thing is, uh, we could say that the global uh, south is to some extent uh, more empowered in the sense that uh, we have countries which have developed great uh, techni technical and uh, industrial skills. And if we manage to organize differently, for example, having alternative payment systems, there are many things we could do within the global south that will empower us collectively and also individually. The International Court of Justice holds on Tuesday in the Netherlands a hearing in which Mexico sues Ecuador following the assault on the Mexican embassy in Quito on April 5th. In this sense, the Mexican delegation presents a proposal for precautionary measures against the Ecuadorian government after the acts in violation of international law in which Ecuadorian agents assaulted the Mexican diplomatic compound to kidnap and detain the Vice President Jorge Glass. In this regard, Mexico requests Ecuador to take measures to warranty the full protection and security of the diplomatic premises. For its part, Ecuador sued Mexico before the ICJ for illegally granting political asylum to the former president, considering that the northern country does not comply with the norms of political and diplomatic asylum and anti-corruption conventions. There are lines in international law which should not be crossed. Regrettably, the Republic of Ecuador has crossed them. The actions undertaken by Ecuador not only transverse the established boundaries of international law, but also have served a disconcerting precedent that reverberates across the international community. In the framework of the public hearing held at the International Court of Justice, the Mexican Foreign Ministry issued the following through their social media account on X. The International Court of Justice will hold the first public hearing in relation to the violent raid by the Ecuadorian police on the Embassy of Mexico and the aggression against diplomatic personnel, which took place on the night of Friday, April 5th. The communique also indicated that Mexico will present its arguments on the violations of international law committed by Ecuador, specifically the principle of inviolability of diplomatic headquarters established in the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. Likewise, it emphasized that in view of the initiation of proceedings that Ecuador filed today in the ICJ against our country, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs informs that it is noteworthy that these accusations are presented almost a month after the violent attack on the Mexican Embassy. However, the accusations were foreseeable and will be responded to at the appropriate procedural moment. In Colombia, authorities detected that over one million ammunition, explosives, grenades and weapons are missing after carrying out inspections within the security forces on February 12th in Tolemaida and on April 1st in La Guajira. The president of Colombia, Gustavo Petro, denounced on Tuesday the discovery of an armed trafficking network within the National Army, which was stealing and selling ammunition and other types of weapons for conflicts such as the one in Haiti. Likewise, the head of state expressed in a press conference that the only explanation for this is that there are networks made up of people from the military and civilian forces dedicated to the arms trade with legal state weapons that are sold to armed groups in Colombia. We have a final short break coming up before we invite you to join our WhatsApp community for our English-speaking audience. You can scan the QR code on screen to join directly and share the link to reach more people. Constant news coverage of Latin America and the Caribbean as well as the rest of the world. Stay connected and informed with Telesur. Final short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Argentina's Chamber of Deputies approved in general the basis 
consist of a package of measures ranging from delegations of power to the national executive, privatizations and dissolution of public agencies. After m almost 20 hours of debates, the initiative promoted by the administration of President Javier Milei was approved with 142 votes in favor, 106 against and 5 abstentions. The bill of the basis law establishes the privatization of public companies, a labor reform, the closing of state agencies and the declaration of emergency, which allows the executive to make decisions about the country without going through the chamber of deputies. The initiative presented by the national government of Javier Milei will be discussed in the Senate for its full approval so that it can be implemented as a national law. In Argentina, during her speech before the parliament, Deputy Natalia Sarasha described the flagship law project as a plan that seeks to plunder the country to benefit the richest sectors and the multinationals. I want to stop by saying that, well, this package of law is not for the freedom of the Argentines, but for the freedom of the richest 1% and the multinationals. So I will call it a basic law for the looting of our country and the loss of all our rights. This bill brought by the executive clearly shows the differences between the urgent needs of the rich sectors and the needs of our people. On Tuesday, delegates worldwide sorted out possible solutions for global plastic pollution at the fourth session of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee in Ottawa, Canada. Negotiations resumed after having met in Kenya five months ago. For the first time, delegates and observers from 175 nations completed a draft which will be turning into an internationally legally binding instrument to diffuse plastics found everywhere from hills to ocean left and within human beings. I note that we have made good progress under this agenda, this agenda item, throughout this session. For compromise, Canada supports the Chair's proposal, which is critically important to advancing our shared goal towards INC5, and we urge members to show the same flexibility to ensure that a decision on intersectional work is agreed for the first time here in Ottawa, so we set ourselves up for success in Busan. On Tuesday, the Olympic flame departed Greece for France aboard the iconic ship Belen. In this way, the Olympic flame began its journey abroad the Belen, Europe's oldest three-masted sailing ship, from Greece to the host country of the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. Meanwhile, the iconic fire will have a 12-day voyage linking the cities of Piraeus and Marseille to add one more chapter to the history of this ship, which 40 years ago was designated as a historical monument. A curious fact is that in 1896, the first Olympic Games of the modern era were held in Greece, and that same year in France, the Belen was built. The route of the Olympic torch relay will be a two-month journey through the French territory starting on May 8, 2024 in Marseille. Venice launched an entrance ticket for single-day visitors, a measure aimed at combating mass tourism. The city, the first to implement such a device, sold some 10,000 tickets online at a price of 5 euros approximately. The measure has met with reluctance among residents who do not want their city to become a museum. The tickets in the form of QR codes have to be presented to the ticket inspectors who are stationed in several places, but specifically at the Santa Lucia train station the main entries, entrance to the city. Although the fee is moderate and the system does not impose a daily limit on the number of visitors, municipal authorities hope it will deter some of the tourists who throng it, its narrow streets and the bridges over its canals on the most crowded days. We have come to the end of this news brief, but you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net and join us on social media, Facebook, X, Instagram, Telegram and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Alejandra Garcia. Thank you for watching.